So listen, Ted, the, the first question is always the obvious one, but essential. So how did this come about and what exactly was it that inspired you to move forward with this project? Um, bef before I answer, I just want to say stepping up on the stage, I feel a little bit like Gustavo stepping onto the Philharmonie Hall in Burlington. It's like, uh, in Berlin, rather. It's sort of like being at the center of the world, this it, theater. Well, center of the, the film Academy. world, yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, the film started, as a lot of films in Los Angeles start, over breakfast in a at a Jewish delicatessen in the valley. <laughs> I, um, I had just finished um, uh, a film called Betting on Zero, which uh, followed a, a billionaire hedge fund manager and a Latino activist as they were trying to expose Herbalife um, as a global international fraud and was looking for a change of pace. And one of the producers of the film, Howard Bragman over Breakfast in the Valley um, asked me if I thought Gustavo Dudamel would make a good subject for a documentary, and it didn't take me very long at all to say yes. I had been a classical musician as a kid. Um, I'd been living in Los Angeles and going to the Philharmonic since long before Gustavo arrived, and um, the idea of pivoting to make a film about a man who was as brilliant as anyone I knew of at bringing art and beauty into the world as opposed to exposing the problems of the world seemed like a very refreshing change. And um, I said yes and was introduced to Gustavo and his management team. And over the course of the summer and a couple of conversations with Gustavo in the fall of 2016, we quickly arrived at a, at a plan. So how were those first, first conversations? And what was your first impression of, of the maestro? Well, um, the first impression is, was not so terribly different from, I, I think, the one that you may have of him from the film, which is that he is as articulate about aesthetic matters as anyone I've ever encountered, um, that he's quite open and accessible and endlessly charming. And um, to my great good fortune, he was very creatively agreeable to the approach that we, that we were talking about, which at that time was uh, a, a film that would explore the art of conducting and the work of bringing uh, uh, orchestral music into the world. I wanted to get inside the imagination of a conductor. It's a strange place to be. I mean, a man is looking at uh, a, a stave with notes on a page, uh, a kind of written language that for most of us is really incomprehensible, and from that formulates an interpretation entirely in his imagination, and then somehow communicates that to a hundred plus musicians over the course of a series of rehearsals that is kind of a dialogue without words. And then they take that and bring it to an audience that's moved enough to cry or leap to their feet. I mean, it's a fascinating process, and, um, and I thought that would be exciting to bring to life, and, and also to bring to life who he was and what made him tick, and he liked the idea. So when you start a documentary, and I ask this about documentary filmmakers all the time, what were your initial goals and how did your goals change? But in your case, your initial goals were sidetracked by a very big change that was thrust upon you. I mean, talk about the mother load of changes. So the question is, as those changes were thrust upon you and upon uh, Maestro Dudamel, um, what were the conversations you had for that shift? And, and was, was Gustavo like on board with that? Um, yes, ultimately, I mean, you see, he, you know, he's with us all the way. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we were in a very strange position. The film had not, not intended to put the problems of Venezuela front and center. You know, we, we weren't going to completely ignore them, but they were essentially something that we thought was a sort of backdrop to his work with the orchestra, both the L.A. Phil and the, and the Bolivars. But the day after that tour ended, Venezuela erupted into the 100 days of protests that you see in the film, violent protests. And... Um, and Gustavo, who had been sort of resolutely um, uh, 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 standing aside from commenting on the issues of, of what was happening at his home, was put in the position you see in the film where he 
felt he had to speak out over a series of uh, different occasions in that summer of 2017. And um, as the film demonstrates, the orchestra that he led had its tour canceled and then players began to leave. And so our intention, which had been to return to Venezuela two or three more times at least, to deepen our understanding of his work with the orchestra and where he came from and how they operated became impossible mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because he wasn't going back. And so we, there was no way we could continue to make that kind of film. And we weren't in a position, and we discussed this with Gustavo, where we could really ignore um, what had happened and sort of elide or skip over the problems of Venezuela and just make a movie about him and music. It, it, it just wouldn't, it would have been irresponsible and, and really blind. So the question then became, what's the story we're now telling and what do we film? And initially we thought we were gonna be telling a reunion story, a story of a man separated from his orchestra trying to bring them back together. And um, to give you an idea of just how intent we were on that, when we went to Mexico City to film what you see in, in the finished documentary as a, uh, as a sort of celebration of youth music making and these wonderful performances of the Dvorak, we brought a bare bones crew and had absolutely no intention of filming any music. We were just interested in what was happening between him and the Bolivars and the story of them getting back together. And a lot of those conversations were too sensitive for us to film which was frustrating and disappointing, and we kept waiting and waiting for something to happen. And thankfully, um, uh, <laughs> the producer of the film, Nick Payne, and, and Buddy Squires, our cinematographer, said, Ted, we're here, we might as well shoot something. I said, but they, we have enough music, we don't need any more music, well, why don't we just do something? Well, let's shoot the kids, let's shoot the kids. And so we found those kids and that music. and. As it turned out, when we got to the editing room to really pull the thing together, it became clear that it wasn't a reunion story we were filming. It was a story about him keeping a brave's dream alive. You know, you went into this film with the with the prospect of of doing something inspirational, uh, enlightening about an artist and, and art and music, and it turned into something that you you had already uh, been experienced with, especially when it came to to uh, Darfur, you know, and the Sudan. So, um, so your film Darfur now. So, how did filming in Sudan back in two thousand seven or so sort of prepare you for what ultimately was going on in Venezuela with your crew? Um, well, on a basic level, um, I was sensitized to the plight of human beings whose country is in profound distress, and to both. The, the pressures they're under, the anguish that they're experiencing, the limitations they have on what they can say and do, um, and the peril they're in. So um, uh, we, as a crew, didn't arrive in Venezuela uh, sort of thinking things were just going to be hunky-dory and we'd be filming rehearsals, and we're mindful of all that, which was important. We're also mindful that we were entering at that time a, a, a dangerous place and had to manage the the risks that the crew was exposed to. You don't feel it in that footage from Caracas, but um, at the time um, it was it was one of the most dangerous cities on the planet, and the big risk uh, that we were concerned about was was kidnapping. There was a, a very very high rate of kidnapping, and and um, and domestically and, and internationally. In other words, local residents as well as, um, as, well as foreigners were, were being kidnapped. And so we had to operate with a, a, a pretty substantial security detail, about four times what I worked with in Sudan. So what were some of the ethical challenges that you were faced with uh, and the crew and Gustavo during that time? Um, I can't really speak to the ethical challenge Gustavo was facing, um, but um, as, a, as, a, as a production team, one of the things you're balancing whenever you're in production is your desire to bring a compelling story to the screen that 
in this case, we weren't trying to expose anything of our characters. We were trying to bring their lives to life. We were to try to do that in a responsible way that doesn't put anyone in any sort of danger, physical or political or you know, um, social danger. And so those were challenges that we you know, navigated and did so in a very direct way you know, in, in Sudan by working with the government, by working with security people, and by working with uh, El Sistema, who was effectively our host. But a second set of challenges arose when we were, you know, when we were releasing the film, or not releasing the film, when we were, when we were cutting the film anticipating its release, and that had to do with the effect of the story we were telling um, on the people involved in it when the film emerged into the world. And, um, and you know, um, there are times when you can, you can make those judgments with a fair degree of confidence inside your own circle. Um, and then there are times when you really need to turn to your subjects and the institutions that they're connected with to make sure that there's no undue harm that's, or unintended harm that's going to come to the people the institutions are involved. And so in our case, we, we, were, we had a cut. We were, we were out to festivals with, with, with a cut um, and about to you know, go into final mixing and color correct when we, we got a sense that that, that cut of the film was, was going to be, be problematic should it emerge in the world, and we had to, we had to go back and, and make some changes. And in the end, um, they, were, they were for the good. I think the film was a better film, um, a whole of us involved in it, Kate, the editor, the producers. Everyone feels like what we came, came up with was, was a better film, but it was that concern of how it would play and the effect of it in the world that, that led us to that. So. Well, Ted Braun, bravo uh -huh. on Vivo Maestro. Thank you very and much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us at this Academy screening of Viva Maestro. Thank you so much, everybody. Good evening. Thank you all.